Hello friends. Um, this is my second recording of the same thing today because the first time I did it um, my microphone pitch was too low and so I had to I have to actually I have to do all it all over again but it should be good for you so I can leave out the mistakes from the first time. Anyway, um, this is the fourth and um, let's see but I think the last uh, part of the series on bicep. As always, you will get uh, the source code I will develop here in the video. I will put it on GitHub and link it in the description. Um, the thing today, which I'm gonna cover, let me uh, check this in my agenda. Um, some, some little parts which I left out uh, in my free parts. Um, so um, the things I wanna cover are how you could potentially do something like debugging in biceps. So trying things out without deploying anything. That's kind of the idea I want to show you. Uh, that's good for beginners um, and if you want to try some stuff out. So speaking of trying stuff out, I will show you how you could use some uh, functions and what the purpose of those functions and maybe how not to use them or why not to use them. Uh, basically unique string and uh, GUID. I will show you this uh, then I show you a cool trick uh, how you could um, you know um, uh, how to say it um, export some of the basic settings you want to be applied to your bicep scripts into a JSON file and then reuse them all over again and I want to show you how to deal with secure values like passwords and stuff like that when you need them in your bicep script. So that's basically the topics today. And with this, right, let's hop right into it. Let me make everything ready. I have a second uh, Visual Studio Code um, here running. And now let's generate, as always, a main, main bicep. And at this position, let's create a, a parameters.json um, because we'll need it soon and let's create a deploy.ps1 which basically in the first step let me copy this out from my other version will have this appearance and now uh, at this point we can say why 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 is he complaining Whoa, what is going on verbose you don't like verbose sad let's format the document and let's see, oh, you see, format document and what, you see this? You see what I see? If I format the document, there's stuff coming in. I don't know how this works, but anyway, let's go in here and check now he's happy, now he's unhappy. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, so this these are the preparations and let's go into my main bicep and let's start over by defining a target scope as always, uh, let's say resource group. And then let's go over here and talk about debugging in quotes. It's not debugging, uh, you know, because it's not a script, but how you can test things out without deploying anything to Azure. So the first thing you'll need here is a resource group in this scenario, which I'm trying out because when I deployed this, he's targeting a resource group. So this resource group must exist. Then we use the template file and let me get rid of this stuff. Um, then we use a template file and this is kind of the minimum what you will need to deploy something to Azure. Okay, cool. So let's go over here and I don't know, oh, now it's correct. So, and I basically don't know what the problem of him is, but anyway, so now we have this. What you could do is you just define a variable, test stuff out, test is one, two, three, four. And now you just simply use the output uh, telling him uh, foo of type string equals test. So this way, this is pretty dumb, but let me do a new terminal and let me actually go to my folder uh, and now deploy PS1 this. So if everything works fine and already ensured that I'm in the correct context on my subscription, so if everything works fine, we should get an output telling us uh, one, two, three, four. Here you see it as foo. Now this is basic stuff, but you can use it to actually perform tests against Bicep without deploying something real. He is pointing to a resource group, so you need a resource group. It does not have to be empty. You just have to be careful that you don't deploy um, 
into this resource group. So don't use resource or whatever here. So what you could do uh, in testing is uh, now we come to some basic operations like this one, unique string, some news for today. So what is unique string? Unique string is a function which generates a string, unique string, I'll show you, by passing him in one or more parameters, which are just values. Like you can actually, actually pass in anything that is a string. So let us do this one and just deploy it again so that you can see what unique string is. For reasons that are not totally uh, clear to me, Microsoft decided that unique string will return a string, which is exactly 13. I don't know why 13, but that's the way they did it. 13 characters long. And the trick here is if I redeploy this, so I re-execute the script, the second time it will generate exactly the same unique string, kind of a hash. A hash now of this value in 13 uh, bits. You see the same value. If I change one of the parameters here, uh, one of the characters, it should generate a new unique string. So you might ask, what is it good for? So it is used in the documentation a lot. Let me check out, you know, you see a completely different unique string because the hash of this string uh, changed. Mostly you will see something like that. Microsoft often uses a resource group function and retrieves the, un the resource ID of the resource group we are deploying to because we are on the scope resource group. And now we are using this to say, if you want to generate a name or something, which is unique, just generate it with the ID of the resource group because this is a unique value on the planet. Now, if anybody else executes this method with its resource group, which cannot be the same as yours because part of a resource group ID is the subscription key. So it is ensured that this value is globally unique, kind of. Okay, now Microsoft uses this to generate something like this. Uh, let's say you want to generate a virtual machine and you need uh, a disk for the virtual machine, so an OS disk. So what you will end up is something like for my VM dot so and then string concatenation, blah, blah, blah. And now you have this value. So this is what you see a lot in the Microsoft documentation. So this ends up in a name. Let me put this in. Now, um, result is this and the prefix uh, and so on. Disk, blah, 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 and then the unique string. So what this ensures is that you don't have name collisions on the name of this resource. In the case of a virtual machine disk, this is not so, um, so important. It's more important if you say, what if it is a website or a storage account or whatever, because those resources need global unique names. And this is kind of the shortcut Microsoft often uses to ensure that a name is globally unique. Okay, that's what they do. Sometimes they take a substring out of it for because three characters are sufficient, whatever. However, I don't recommend using unique string. So I just say unique string equals, let me do the more and stuff, danger. So this is what, what I tell you. Don't do it. So you may ask why, because um, but I, I say unique string is uh, pointing you in towards a direction or um, uh, tilting you towards a direction where you will end up with a naming convention, which is not worth the name naming convention. So a naming convention is a pretty important stuff. That's just a dog yelling. Uh, never mind. Um, so the naming convention stuff is uh, coming out of the part governance and governance is uh, pretty, pretty important in Azure all over the place. And one part of it is that you have a strict um, plan how to name resources and um, how to avoid naming conflicts with other users of Azure, which is actually not so easy because Microsoft um, decides some stupid stuff which I can understand sometimes. For instance, that certain resources like container registries and let's say storage accounts um, 
are always uh, named without special characters. So you can do this one, storage account for devdeer, which is my project um, dot demo for the stage. So that would be a name we, we would use. So that's, that's not possible because Microsoft first of all says, you know, you don't allow to use hyphens. So you end up with something like this for whatever reason, I don't understand, but anyway. And then it's limited to, I think, 30 characters too. So sometimes it gets pretty hard and tough to generate unique name, which is sensible, but not colliding. Anyway, this is unique string. Um, you don't, should, you, you shouldn't use it, in my opinion. Okay, let's do another function, which is pretty important, which is GUID, which is similar to unique string, is kind of the sibling of it. And now we could do exactly the same so this one um, and what you often need is um, first uh, let's say assignment you see in a second what I mean with that so because there are certain resources if we go there role assignment from role assignments this version I don't care so you have a role assignment and the role assignment um, is if you have a user principal, which can be an app registration or a real user and you want assigned this user to this already existing role. So what you can do here is you now have a resource because you say, you know why? What my role is a role definition um, which comes with this guy and now we want to give it a name and let's call it my role dev. So this would fail because now you would do my role ID. So referencing this guy. By the way, at this point, oh, I come later to this. Never mind, um, just concentrate on the topic. So you can't do this. Why? If we go here to this documentation, I'm already here. You see, that's, uh, that's the advantage if you record things twice. So uh, while I'm here, you know what? I think it's a good idea to switch on Dark Reader. Okay, so while I'm here, uh, this is the documentation for role definition, which we are trying to deploy. And it says the name here is, first of all, a string with maximum of 36 characters, and it must be a global unique identifier. So now, this is the purpose of this method. So what you need here is this guy. You want to generate a value which always results in the same GUID, but this GUID should be unique inside the resource group. But if you redeploy this and you have, let's say you have two roles, another role, now you have to ensure that the Second one, test two, is generated with a unique value too, but this unique value has to differ from this unique value. So that's why you pass in a second parameter to ensure the complete hash of this is taken into account for this GUID. And now it's working. Okay, now, now he, he, uh, you have two GUIDs, which you can use here without any problem. And you are sure that they are GUIDs. So that's just a sidetrack for explaining GUID. So let me just for the purpose of having this stuff, my GUID is this one. And then you can use this GUID and now we know what it's good for and how it's working. Um, it's just uh, something, let's go blah, blah uh, to show this. And now we can put out my GUID, test it out, and we should see a GUID. Those are um, pretty important methods. Uh, or well, this is an important method, GUID, and don't touch unique name. I don't like it. Anyways, here's a GUID, and you can totally use it. This is pretty useful. Okay, cool. Uh, next thing uh, I wanted to show you is, what was it, what was it? Let me go into my markup and unique string, we got it, okay. Now we have this options thing. So let's imagine you have something like this. You have a module, and I talked about modules in another part, my module, and this module is a bicep. And this thingy 
is responsible for deploying a resource. Resource uh, storage is storage account. And this is deploying a storage account. So what you now need is a name and a location. So you could pass in all those variables which are needed because what you need here now often is if you want to generate the name, you need string concatenation, which is kind of prefix. And then you need the project and stuff like that. And, and this turns out or this is the name. Okay, so instead of doing this, you just define, you know what, I just want to be to exist a parameter called options of type object. And now we just type in options.prefix followed by options.project. Okay, I just typed this. And now you could say options.location and SKU is, let's say, uh, premium LRS standard on kind is only blob. So that's, that's pretty valid, this thing. So now you, instead of having one, two, three parameters, you just um, say, I wish those values to be part of this object. So what you could do now is generate here an options as an object, and you can do it this way. So what you say is prefix is DD or CF for coding freaks and project as another thing is a sample and location is simply the resource groups location. So not a problem at all here. Let's do it another way. Let's just write West Europe. Okay, this way. Okay, fine. So now, uh, if you want to deploy the module, uh, module, my, my Moodle, my module, not Moodle, <laughs> whatever. Uh, module, my module, uh, and you give it a name, test, and you say, give me the required parameters. All you have to do is, again, you can now name it test because it's just the name of the module, and now you pass in the options as one object. That's a trick which is often used to avoid touching all the modules and adding parameters, parameters. If you add more options, you just pass in a complete object. I hope you understand what I'm doing here. So let me command this out just for the sake of understanding. So now output options object uh, is options. And now um, options result. Okay, cool. Let's deploy this. I just commanded out the module so I don't deploy actually anything. And I just want you to see what options is. Um, I, I think I just hit my mic. So that's not a good idea. So first trick, use options for uh, just a single object to pass multiple uh, values. You can see here, everything is inside of it. Now, the bad thing about it, if you have a lot of, you know, uh, starting modules in your project because you deploy a sophisticated infrastructure, this is this kind of sucks because you need this options declaration in every controlling module, uh, in every controlling bicep file, which calls modules. This kind of sucks. So instead of doing this, let's generate a new file and call it settings.json. And let's put in all this into a settings.json. Let's copy this. This is not valid. We need to do the double quoting and I'll do it idiotically. Let's do, I think this way. And I think he needs double quotes for whatever reasons, because I obviously, I just created it this way. Format the document and this is just the JSON file. Cool, what you could do now is that you say, no, no, no. Don't define them, just say, you know what, load from text content and the text content is defined in settings.json. This is okay, but this is string. This is just text. And now you pass this into the JSON function and now you got it and you even get IntelliSense. If you go here, let me get rid of the commands. If you hit here, he knows everything about the file. Bad thing is you can't have string concatenation 
whatever here because he says not this but let's do this one and he says you are not allowed to do this because the value must be a constant at compile time so this is how the load text content method is implemented so you have to stick with the name settings json must be existing so now uh, what we get is exactly the same result as here should be if I redeploy this we should get exactly the same result but this time we have this straightforward JSON file and now we can use it and we can do a cool trick here so it's the same result and now we can leverage the fact that we are having uh, deploy JSON and we can add uh, the following I just paste it in. First of all, I add a parameter to a parameter to this file, which means you have to pass in the stage, which can be def or prod, in order for me uh, or in order for you to deploy this thing. And then what you do is this one. Uh, let me bring in my code. This thing generates a new source file name, which is settings and then followed by the stage and dots and then JSON. And all we have to do is we have to create a settings.defjson, which is calling this the dev sample. And then we copy this to prod.json, like production stage, and this is the prod sample. Okay, cool. Let's close them out. And now my script is just, you know, taking this file, either this or that, and then overwriting the content of this to this. So and now it and then it calls the deployment. So let us try this out. Let us do stage dev magically. Come on, I have a cup of coffee, a sip of coffee. Delicious. It's simply okay. Now dev sample, and now let's go prod, and it should be prod sample. And this way, if this works, it should work. This way you have a simple controlling instance using your script where you can say, depending on the stage or whatever you have as a dependent variable, I want to um, pass in some variables into my bicep file, not parameters, variables, which are simply defined by JSON file, which gives you a lot of convenience. Okay, cool trick and it's uh, utilizing <coughs> PowerShell in combination with JSON load text content. Um, I think we, uh, at this point I might tell you what I'm currently up to. Maybe I will uh, contribute to the GitHub repository, but I'm currently kind of waiting if somebody else uh, does the job, to be honest. <laughs> <coughs> and what I have on my wish list for Bicep, because we're currently 0.4, right? What I have on my wish list is a command which should work like this. Uh, let's assume we have a file called shared bicep and <coughs> the idea the idea what I uh, have here right now is if you have variables defined in the shared bicep they are kind of imported into this bicep which I'm currently in the main bicep and um, IntelliSense um, is just kept there that would be cool because that that would lead to a thing where i can prepare my complete stage with variables and parameters and stuff like that and then i have kind of type safety when it comes uh, to the actual bison files that would be good okay that's just an idea and so you know what i'm currently thinking about cool last thing for today and um, a very important thing is stuff like that. Let's assume you want to deploy a SQL Server. And now you have classically admin user, which is a string as a parameter, not a var, param. So you have to pass in the admin user and you have to pass in the admin pass, which is a string. First of all, what you should do, or let me just, um, no, step by step. Let us now go to our parameters file and add something, which is, uh, let's do this. I copy over some stuff. Where's my parameters here? Paramet parameters. Oh, it's empty. That's not good. Let us do a trick. Uh, let me take this and now I need two curlies. Bam. 
So what you have, you basically take your admin user here and just say coding freaks admin is this guy. So nothing new here. So now comes the admin pass. Is it admin pass? It is. So admin pass is what, what you see a lot is stuff like that. Uh, secret password, which is for several reasons a pretty bad idea. So now I have this and obviously this is working now. If I just pass in the parameters file, I can use them. So let me username is a string which equals the admin user and let me do something which is pretty bad. Never you do this is admin pass. It's just for, you know, uh, never do this. I don't know how to put more exclamation marks in it. And now this is danger. Okay, never do this. Okay, cool. But for the sake of um, demonstration it should be okay. So if we just deploy this, it works. You know, no, it doesn't because I have commented out my, this guy, and now he's complaining, where is my parameter? Okay, you no, know, I know, it's cool. So let me take this on and then deploy. And now he's not asking for the parameter because this file contains the parameter, but I have the wrong name. Admin user, what is going on? Admin pass. And here is admin user admin pass. And I don't get it. What is going on? Uh, stage prod. Why? 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 Deploy. Source file. You. Oh, here. See this? Okay. Let's go. Admin user. Admin pass. And it should work. So at this point. Um, you just have a secret. So, but obviously for several reasons, that is not a good idea because this is part of your source code. If you do infrastructure as code, my doc is coming down. If you have infrastructure as code, this will end up in Git or in Azure DevOps or whatever. You don't want this to happen. So what you need to do is, first of all, you have to tell the bicep that this thingy is a secure string. This is an attribute which you pass in here and you tell them, you know, that kind of sensitive information, that's at secure. It's not encrypting it or doing anything like that, but now he understands that this is a bad idea telling you output should never contain secrets, which is good, which is the same as I told you. You see, I know it. So now the question here is, how can I pass in this value without putting it into the parameters file? And the easy solution for this is, if you are in Azure, which you obviously are, is a tool called Azure Key Vault. And I'm already in here. So what you see here is the Azure Key Vault. And what you could do in an Azure Key Vault, you can hold different types of uh, sensitive information. For instance, passwords are holding secrets. So let me generate a new password here and let's call it demo SQL admin password. And let's give it test one, two, three, four, and let's create it. Uh, yeah, I know because I already have had one from the first. So I, I just give it this name, copy it out. And now what I do, that was dumb. For Now what I do is I bring in some example code. Instead of giving it a value, you reference it. You give him a reference. Let me format my document. Now you say, you know, I don't pass in the value directly. You need to get the value. You meaning Azure Resource Manager. I just explained in a second. So what it needs, it needs this ID. And what it is, it is the resource ID of a key vault. How do you get it? Simple as that. You go to your Azure Key Vault in the Azure portal, go to the overview here, and then you hit this link here. If you hit it, Right on top, you get the resource ID. Just copy this thing out because this is a relative path pointing to your key vault. And now just paste it in here. Okay, and all you need now is the key. The key again is in the secrets, this guy. J 
just pass it in. And now if I have this, just like that, and I redeploy, you see what happens. We need to talk about this for a second, how it does it work and stuff like that. I will tell you. Just let's check if this works. You see, test one, two, three, four. And now let me change this by giving it a new password version. This is cool. Create. And I created this in Azure. Never updated something here. And just like that, as you can see in a second or two or three, or maybe after I sip coffee. Ah, see, here now you have got another secret. And that's it, just like that. So you have to have it here. Uh, let me undo this here just for a second, because when I check this in, I don't want to have this uh, or stand this in my, in my secret file. So that's it. Um, that is uh, a secret store. So this works only because you have to understand what is happening here when you deploy this. Inside of the key vault, there's a setting in the access policies and the settings which is important here is this guy, this checkbox. If this is checked, this means that the Azure Resource Manager is able, is has access enabled to this key vault. So what this now means is, okay, there is a component called Azure Resource Manager and it is able to access all the secrets, certificates and stuff like that as an Azure resource. So why is this important for us? It is important because when we execute this command in PowerShell or you take the equivalent in AZ, Azure CLI, whatever, if you execute this, you are sending a script, a compiled JSON file, not the bicep thing. You, this thing will generate the JSON for you and then send it over to the Azure Resource Manager living in Azure. So there obviously is a component called Azure Resource Manager, which gets the script and then executes it there and then returns if this succeeded. And because this script or this component, Azure Resource Manager, which is running our BICEP or the resulting JSON, is enabled to access this key vault, it can retrieve the secret. That's a complete thing. Okay, so that was quite a bit. Um, we uh, covered a lot of stuff. The last thing was pretty, pretty, pretty important, but nevertheless, just keep in mind, you have the ability to generate options more elegant than just typing it in or passing parameter by parameter. You have the GUID method, which is very important in some scenarios. If you have modules and stuff like that, I just commented it out, but you know, it will be part of the solution. You never do this, but I leave it here. You know, you never do this, but for the demo, it's important. And uh, this shows you how to pass in secret values into the stuff. So that was it. This was at the moment, the last part of the series on the bicep series. If you're interested in more parts and there's one thing left, which is um, where can I have a library of my bicep uh, files, which is pretty important if you define your modules. Um, you have two options. One of them is a private Azure container registry and the other option is uh, deploying a NuGet package. If you are interested, guys, in seeing how to do it, just leave commands here in the sections and I will do a fifth part uh, covering it. And I also would do an update part if uh, the new version of Bicep occurs or important new things occur. And then I will head over and create a fifth, maybe a sixth and seventh part, but leave comments here uh, as a time of recording. So this means today the, the state of the art is that nobody is pretty interested in bicep, <laughs> at least in my bicep uh, tutorials. Maybe this changes if this gets more mature, the technology. Let's see. Uh, leave me comments. Um, I hope you enjoyed and see you next time.